Welcome to the next session of our Ask Tom special series. Last time I bear talked about um, spatial in conjunction with JSON and GeoJSON data. And where we left it last time, um, the was um, also looking into REST and spatial data or accessing spatial data via REST services. And this is what Abir uh, will be focusing on today. So Abir, the stage is yours. Thank you. Let's begin. You know, last time we talked about uh, well, the topic was actually JSON and REST, but at the end we turn only talking about uh, about JSON. And so today we'll talk more about REST and spatial and how these things fit together and how they fit together at Oracle with our product line, etc. but also in a generic way. Um, on the menu today is, uh, that's the menu. So we're going to first uh, look at uh, Geospatial and REST, you know, wh wh why is that useful and uh, at all? In fact, why do we care? And uh, how long that's been going? Then we talk about Spatial Studio. You know, that's our favorite uh, topic when, uh, when you ask us, well, how do you do this? The answer would be Spatial Studio. So Spatial Studio will show, uh, I'll, show I'll try and show some examples of how, how we do this. There'll be a bit of repetition of what we've done before because there's some overlap. Then we talk about something really different that, I don't know how many of you know about that, but it's uh, Oracle REST Data Services, so ORDS. That's a feature of the database that's been evolving over year, over year, et cetera. And that makes it possible for you to essentially do pretty much everything on the database through a REST API. And, and we'll now enter into the whole of REST, it's the whole of uh, ORDS, it's a big topic and can, can do lots of things with it. But <clears throat> we will look at, uh, at this from the spatial perspective. And finally, we look at another kind of uh, REST API. And again, Studio comes here. Studio itself has its own REST API, which means you can actually drive Studio from applications or from scripting. And we'll see one example of that, which is to, to use the uh, geocoding. API that, um, sorry, that the, G, the API, the REST API of Studio to use uh, geocoding, to perform geocoding. So last time, yeah, we know about what we've been talking going on uh, in the past in uh, Ask Tom, uh, and you can find out what these things are. Uh, just a few words about our reference architecture for a geospatial data platform. You see the URL at the bottom, and, uh, and Karin is going to put this URL also in the chat. That, that shows how the bits and pieces that we have fit together in terms of uh, data enrichment, data storage in AWA and, and tools, spatial data loading, spatial visualization, local de development with Apex and, and all of these good things. How do they fit together? So geospatial and rest, a long history. Yeah, this has been going on for a long while. In the beginning, uh, there was chaos. You know, that, that's, that's oh, lots of icons here, lots of companies. Some of them are no longer there, some of them are not there. But the geospatial world has always been very fragmented. Lots of actors, each one with their own APIs, their own standards, their own way of doing things, and their own storage formats. And so the reality was that in many applications, in many uh, user contexts, <clears throat> people would use multiple of these tools. And so they would go into an endless operation of uh, converting data from like S3 to Autodesk to Bentley to, uh, to and then introduce a spatial, sorry, uh, introduce an open source tool like GeoServe, et cetera. And that's really, first of all, a waste of time. Plus all these coming and going, it means that sometimes that eventually data loses quality. So came the Open Geospatial Consortium. That is a body that was formed, um, I think in the mid nineties, so it's like last century. When, when everybody realized we need to do something about this. And when you need to do something about something, what you do, you get together, you form a committee and start talking and negotiating between each other. <clears throat> so this consortium was formed initially by well, the big consumer of spatial data. So the uh, you know, public sector, you know, people that do land use, cadastre, infrastructure, also the academics, the universities, the providers, so the SRI, but also Oracle, Microsoft, and uh, and these people and and uh, and at the end this resulted to standards standards why are standards useful why, why do we need standards um so this is the the, the home page of the ogc uh, standard uh, as it is today 
Well, standards are fundamental building blocks of interoperability. They make it possible for multiple things to work together. That's how we are able to put the plug into, uh, I can take my, my laptop and plug it in the plug in Germany, it will work. I won't work in the UK. They have different standards, but then they are adapters. So, okay. um, in IT, well, in, especially here in, in, in spirit data processing, there are essentially three things where we see uh, that, that resulted from the effort of the OGC. Languages, so simple features for SQL, that is the very first standard they defi define. And that's the one that we use actually to uh, represent our types in the database. So SDO geometry, it's ST geometry, with SDO geometry, Others, you know, PostGIS does it differently, but this is one standard. The second standard, or another standard, is the data formats, so that we can actually exchange data between each other from without having to transform things, but like by using common structures, the well-known text, well-known binary, that they came out very early, and then geographic markup language, so XML, GML, but also or GeoJSON, GeoTIFF, all of this came from, um, well, well, maybe not GeoJSON, I think JSON is more um, uh, W3C, ATF, but <clears throat> GeoTIFF and many others, they came from uh, from OGC, from the consortium. And then web services, because that allows us to plug things together. Web services, why not REST? Well, because this has been developed in the, well, early 2000s and, and late 90s. So at that time, you didn't really talk too much about REST. This is a fairly recent concept, but that's what they do. So the web mapping service is a service that lets me fetch images, map images for something. So if you publish your data as WMS using all sorts of tools, but pretty much all, um, all GIS tools offer the ability to actually ingest a web map service, but also publish as web map. Like GeoServer does that. Even QGIS, QGIS can import from anything, and we can do the same thing with Studio and others. WFS shares data, and but there's more. There's WCS for imagery, for rasters, uh, catalog services, and more. Like that. I included here the logo of this this one. This sort of um, well, I always look found this look like a pineapple, but I don't know it's not a pineapple. It's Inspire. Inspire is an, is an initiative and directive from the EU Commission that requires all the provider and consumer, but providers of geospatial information across the EU, in all 27 countries of the EU, to share that data using common standards. And what are these common standards? OGC standards, of course. Why, why would we reinvent new ones when they are used? Actually, Inspire is also used in other places, not really new, just because of the uh, formal definition and the tooling available for sharing geospatial information. So web map service, like I said, WMS provides maps. Request, give me a map, here's your map, here's your picture, here's your image. Do whatever you like with it. Like put it on your own map or save it or print it, whatever. Web feature service, so a web map service will actually show me a map of, let's say, a forest fire. Maybe it's coming from satellite imagery, so I have, ah, there's a forest fire here, and that's all. The um, web feature service will actually show me data, not maps, data. So with web feature service, if uh, I have like, for example, the, the spread of a forest fire, well, that will give me that spread as a geometry that I can then use and query and, and mix with my own data. For example, find out people at risk or property at risk. Uh, the web coverage service is designed to share raster information. So grids, raster satellite imagery, et cetera, as pure data. WMS just shows me an image of a map. WCS will actually allow me to download raster, to distribute rasters. Okay? And then there's a lot of data, so we need a way to search for it and organize and find it. That's a catalog service for the web. They couldn't call it CSW because WCS, but that's already used, so they call it CSW instead. That's also something we, very important for, for standards. So the web map service, this is the page that points to the uh, OGC standard. You can read that, you can download this uh, PDF, right? it's wonderful reading. Notice it has not changed since 2000, 2006 because it's a pretty simple standard. There's not too much we can do more with this or you can do with this. The WFS standard keeps on evolving and then the, all the new standards keep on evolving. But you can download this and read it, it's fascinating reading. I mean, if you're really bored at night, you can read that. Um, and, I, and also you see on the side here, you have a list of all the standards that they've been designed, things like GeoSparkle, uh, 
from groundwater ML, which is again probably some XML derivative specifically for groundwater management, and KML is part of it. Yeah, interesting. LAS is also part of your location services, and many of these. So the web map service is very easy. It works like this. Uh, as a client, as a user, you send a get capabilities request to the server. The server, and that's that's really says, what can you do for me? And the server says, I can do this for you. And then if you agree, then you are going to do start doing get map. You say, give me a map here and there of that particular size. Practically speaking, it's like this. Um, and that actually shows something which is very interesting for OGT services. They are very well designed in that they include a version number. So this says I'm connecting to that particular web service, WMS. That's my version number. That's the version number I, I can handle, which means I can handle that one and probably all the ones as well, mm -hmm. because standards change, of course. So we need to have this sort of thing. Uh, the service I want to talk about, the WMS, I don't know, or of course, WMS. Well, it could, could be something else. Could, this could be a, a generic access point that serves WFS or them. So I have to say, what I want, what I want, which service I want to access, and then the request is get capabilities, and the response will be, are uh, running at one three zero, so we're fine, and this this um, well these are the services I can do, which is really just get map and, and maybe another one, but here the layers this this says and these are the layers I have. This is the data I have with what it is. So there's a name, uh, what kind of system, what area it covers, uh, these sort of things, right? Um, so if the service that you talk to does not know about 130, it will answer and say, well, I understand 110 or 100. And then it's up to you as a client to say, well, okay, that's fine. I can I'm just like downgrade my expectation and work at a lower level. So that's very nice. All the standards defined by GOGC, all the web standards or the rest defined by GOGC have this negotiation phase. You know, it's like, you know, two modems, uh, no, and trying to hook up with each other. And so a, a map request will be something like that. So you say, what kind of image do I want? JPEG, PNG, et cetera. What's the current system? What's the bounding box amount? What's the width in terms of pixels, which defines the scale as well? And then what layers do I want on that map? And the result would be an image of that particular you know, type and size and, and area of coverage. The WFS is a bit more complicated, but, but, but here we actually get data. So, but still, first call, get capabilities. The result will be, well, here is the data I have in the query systems and what in the and no, what, what are they? Uh, uh, but then I need to find out how is my data formed? What are the properties? Like in, in a like a described table, show me the table, uh, the, the columns, and also the data type. So that's what this does. This graph. Describe a few times, we actually return an XML schema. And then using the XML schema, the client will then look at this and say, well, okay, I want this, this, this columns, and this particular query. And then that does a get feature, which returns a feature collection. Obviously, these things are not meant to be used by humans. That's all machine to machine connect connection. So uh, some, the client will know how to do this in the right sequence. For example, you, your QGIS client will know how to do that exactly. And so this is my, my get feature. You see the syntax that is used here is essentially a query. So at the end, what the feature service has to do is pass this thing here, this uh, you know, query property, et cetera, and turn that into something that reads from somewhere. Now, of course, in our case, being database people, that somewhere has to be a database. So it has to be aware of, has to have tables and columns, et cetera, and SQL. So all WFS service, because you have a WFS service, uh, all it does really, I mean, it's not all that. If I just say, all it does is this, and some people, I don't know who's saying, oh, come on. It's much more than that. Yeah, but fundamentally that's what it does. It takes this query and turns it into SQL, then runs the SQL on the database and, and sends the result. And the result will be a feature collection, which is going to be GML, GML, GML. Remember all these standards, you know, GML and, uh, and WFS query, of course, they are reused. We're not going to invent a new way of representing data here if we already have a standard one. And so the client will get these things, that data, and can do whatever the, the client wants to do. Like, for example, maybe printing it out, but mostly showing it on the map, but also using it for queries. So getting, for example, my forest fires, my 
my the location. For example, I may offer a service which is going to track the fire brigade and the engines and where are people, etc., and then overlay that on another map, but also do queries or so find out which is the, the available engine nearest your first fire. And then came Oracle. You know, Oracle came like also in, the, in that game, uh, also about the mid 90s, but mostly the 2000, the end 90s, mid 90s. And so, what do we have? Well, how, what, what did we do with these standards? Well, language and APIs, like I said, that led to the development of the SDO geometry type or ST geometry. Now, the standards really say this should be ST geometry. We said, no, no, we'll call it SDO geometry. Yeah, but. If you want to be conformant, if you want to have the, the stem that says, yes, Oracle, you are compliant, then you have to create this geometry. So we do have that as well. It's a little known fact, but you can do spatial queries using ST geometry, which is really like a, a thin layer on top of SDO geometry. It's more like a, you know, sort of a cosmetic uh, thing, but that's possible. Data formats, so GML, well-known text, more money. We do implement all of these, we provide methods and functions to convert from one to the other. So it's easy from Oracle to publish data, for example, in GML, in well-known text, but also in KML, in JSON, and we know all of this. And then we have the web services, okay, REST web services, WMS, WFS. We, we do have WMS, so we publish, and we, we are able to publish and ingest WMS, WFS, CSW, WCS. Not all tools and different tools, but but we 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 do that. So it, that so web applications are provided. Well, web application applications, web applications. These are web again. They are provided with the um, your Oracle deployment. If you look at uh, Oracle Home, MD, um, uh, I think it's called JLib. You will find a bunch of air files, and they represent these things. And you can also ingest some of these, not necessarily only. And we also provide uh, cloud marketplace applications for that. Two import, three important ones, one called Oracle Spatial Services. That's the one that has all the uh, WFS, CSW, uh, and WCS there. So it's deployable in-house if you want, or you can deploy it in the Oracle Cloud using that cloud marketplace application. There's also the um, MapVis, map, map Visualization Company. Let's say Map Viewer. It's easier to say Map Viewer than Map Viewer. So Map Viewer, um, which has a web map service, a web map server, web, web map service. So not only does it provide an API for building uh, you know, mapping applications, so make maps and interact with maps, et cetera, that is actually used deep inside for certain things deep inside the studio and in other places uh, but it also comes with a full-fledged web map service okay so the web map service is here the web feature service is separate it's the uh, uh spatial map services and then you have, of course studio well, studio is our flagship map interaction product it lets end users deal with maps so generate maps manage the spatial data do queries and searches uh, on, on maps. And in terms of REST API here, well, we'll, we'll encounter it in two ways. One way is that, it can, or maybe three ways actually. <clears throat> One way is that it can read certain web services from um, other places, from, from providers and use that uh, in, uh, well, to, to make maps or to, mostly we have make maps and, and do uh, special queries. <clears throat> It can also publish its own data, the data it manages, as GeoJSON endpoints. And it has its own REST API that allows me to drive it and do certain operations. So in summary, that's what Oracle has today. So WMS, it's published through the Spatial Map Visualization Company, also known as MapViewer. Um, and it can be consumed by uh, MapViewer, by a spatial map viewer. So, so, uh, so you know, MapViewer can act as uh, something that can get data from multiple WMS sources and then maybe merge them together and produce uh, a different output also as a WMS. And of course, Spatial Studio can also um, read and, uh, and use WMS. WMTS, I didn't mention WMTS. WMTS is like a derivative of WMS. It's one where instead of uh, having um, application requesting a exact map here on this, and then one of here, and then one like that, one like this. The data is actually exposed as a bunch of tiles with the same size on the ground and the same 
kind of same resolution at different zoom levels. That's called web night web map tile service. And so Spiro Studio is able to do that to fetch from web tile service and also publish uh, that's map that's map base. So map, yeah, map base. WFS, WCS, CSW, they are all published through Spirit Web Services, and they are at the moment only uh, read by MapVis. Work is in progress for future versions of Spirit Studio, eventually to also uh, access WFS and, and WCS as well. Right. So we talked about uh, the uh, Oracle and OGC Web Services, now we use. Now, uh, something I need to talk about is also this. Uh, we call it, nowadays we call it Oracle Maps Cloud. In the past, we used to call it Oracle Maps. Or you may have heard about this as uh, eLocation. So eLocation or Oracle Maps Cloud or Oracle Maps is a set of REST services uh, that provide uh, a number of uh, very useful or fundamental even uh, uh, geospatial services, mapping, so making maps. Uh, we provide map tiles and vector tiles, etc. So that are used in as base maps. You can use this. Uh, geocoding. Well, coding is that important process that says I have an address and I'm getting a X Y coordinates, so long lat coordinates with all the sort of details about that. Routing says I have two locations and I want to find the best way to get from one to the other. These services are used in many Oracle tools and applications. Well, tools and applications here mean, uh, in terms of tools specifically, Spatial Studio does it. Well, you know, the base maps you see come from here. The geocoding service in Spatial Studio uses the geocoding uh, uh, service offered by Oracle Maps Cloud. Um, Apex also uses base map from, uh, from Oracle Maps. It also uses the geocoding API. Um, autonomous databases uh, has a geocoding API. Uh, uh, now, why why do we why is it important that it is used in many Oracle tools applications? Why is that important? Because if you read the thing, the fine print here on that page, it says the data user is licensed from Kia Technologies. So we have an agreement with here. We pay them royalties for these things, and our agreement is limiting us to using this thing for, of course, demos and and test and, uh, and development, but also that uh, they are subject to licenses. And so therefore we cannot just let our users use it freely. Our restriction here is that users can use these things freely as long as they use it through Oracle developed tools and applications, right? So if you want to do, for example, geocoding, you can do that for free. You can use this uh, address data for free worldwide. Uh, as long as you do it through Spatial Studio, Apex, uh, or if you are an automotive database user using a geocoding API uh, in that software in automotive databases. With this, let's go on our second of our second part, uh, second item on our menu, and that is Spatial Studio. You know, when we talk about Spatial, we need, yeah, of course, Spatial Studio has to be part of the picture, and it is part of the picture. And so we'll see how Studio can, what can, what can it do uh, for us in terms of uh, REST APIs and web services, etc. So the first thing we're going to look at is uh, see how Spatial Studio can use web map services. Now we talked about WMS, they're available everywhere. They're pervasive, lots of them are free. So why can I not use them? Well, I can use them using Spatial Studio. So how do I consume? We have to look at how do we, how do we, uh, how can you consume a GeoJSON URLs or data stream this way? How can we publish GeoJSON URL from Studio uh, as well? Special Studio, I expect that pretty much everybody in the audience knows about it by now. I've been talking about that pretty much every session so far. <clears throat> if not, well, Special Studio is a, a flagship product we developed um, uh, maybe four or five years ago. I think it's fairly recent. Uh, that is essentially your uh, UI over spatial data. So it lets you manage the data. So there's a repository of data sets. So not, not data itself. It does not 
store the data, but it manages pointers to where data is. Data is actually data set, which means we database tables in all sorts of schemas and databases. It uh, it has the concept of connections precisely, which which direct us to databases, not another, another source. And then projects. Well, a project is something where you say I'm using a base map. I'm going to take data sets. Ooh, that was brutal. Uh, data sets uh, onto um, base map and then do queries and manipulations. Mm -hmm. There's a URL at the bottom that will uh, take you there and uh, you know, help you get started. We have uh, you can deploy that um, on your desktop. You can deploy it in house inside a uh, like a Tomcat or web, you know, it's only web logic, web logic server, and you can all deploy it on the Oracle cloud using a cloud marketplace image. We talked about this. I showed you the, uh, I mean, I showed you a screenshot of how you get uh, the URL to get uh, that marketplace. It's all completely free. Good. So, WMS. Uh, how can I use WMS datasets in uh, as a dataset in Studio? Well, there are three steps I need to go through. First of all, I need to create a connection to a WMS service. Right? WMS service, they, they, they have a URL. And then uh, to do things, you use URL and you say get capabilities, get map, etc. So what you need is the URL, the base, not the get capabilities, just the, the URL. You need to you know, specify that as a connection in, uh, in WMS. You also need to add this URL to a safe domain. Why safe domain? Well, because there are some safety mechanisms in Studio that if you connect to external world, you must explicitly approve that. Now, I mean, you, of course, if you are running this on your desktop, it's you. But if, if you are running this uh, as a service that is used, a Studio as a service that is used by many of your uh, internal users, you may not want each and every user to go and fetch data from each and every uh, no server on the internet uh, that they find they get their hands on. So in other words, an administrator, so a user with admin rights on Studio <clears throat> must then add this to a list of accessible domains. If that is not done, well, you won't be able to access WMS. And then the last bit is to create data sets. On the because remember, a WMS service can offer many layers, many data sets. And so each or one or combination of these layers will now become a data set in um, sorry, in uh, in uh, Studio Apartment. So let's let's do this. Um, let's do it for for real. So here I am like that. Uh, so here is my spatial studio. This is uh, actually one running locally on my laptop. You see, there's a lot of connections already uh, existing. So we're going to add the um, uh, an example connection, and the connection I'm going to use here is is this one. It's actually the one which is also mentioned as example in the manual. It's uh, it's NOAA, North, North American uh, Weather Bureau, that shows things like this. You see here, I think these things must be like tornadoes or radars, or so, some weather aid information. On, on the right side here, you see what is available. So weather radar. To find out the URL you use, I think you do this, and it shows, uh, mm, I think, this one. Now, this one shows the URL for, for the, uh, the, the web map service, and this actually uh, will get me to the capabilities. Actually, if I click this, it shows me I'll get capabilities. So, um, we go, oops, what did I do here? Oops, oops, oops. Oh, come on. Sorry about that. Uh, so, I wanted to go back here to this because I wanted to copy this simply. I wanted to copy this since that is going to be the, uh, URL of the WMS service I want to use. Oh, this is this is the copy. I wanted to copy this. So that's actually the base. This is the, the domain I need to put in the same domain. Right, okay, let's go back here. Connection, uh, create connection. And you can see I can create a, a normal database connect. That's for a local database. I mean, non-autonomous database. That we an autonomous database. Then I need a, a wallet if I have a wallet. Or not. OGC map services, so I select this. It's selected by this little green thing here. Next uh, name, I'm going to call this NOAA. There's actually one already defined, I think it's NOAA radar or something. So I'm going to call this NOAA, uh, NOAA 2, to avoid uh, collisions and no description. WMS URL, pop this. Now this, there are two ways I can put URL actually. I can put a full, Get capabilities URL like here, so I can just uh, do that, or I can just uh, I, I can just uh, say this OWS. So here, 
I'll, I'll leave it like this because it's easy, you know, I just copy paste and why should I edit this? I can choose the version. Remember, you are, um, WMS is very multiple versions. And this just says that, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with the latest release. There's nothing to change here. So I should now say this. So now it's connecting. It was created successfully. So where, where is it? Oh, well, there are so many connections here. Um, luckily, I can search for it. So no radio. Right? So no radar is one I had already before. I did you know, for testing all this. And that's the new one. And here, here I can find details about it. Uh, you know, property. There's not much to say here. I say it says the owner is myself. Uh, the URL is here, and uh, that's all. There's not much to say. Type the message. There it is. So I have my connection. <clears throat> now, before <clears throat> I'm able to use it to host data sets, I must add it to the uh, um, save domains. So save domains administration. Save domains. Oh, I think I need to cancel all of this here first. So some mess up, right? So uh, as I was saying, uh, we 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 have all this, and here is no cost uh, goa. It's already there because I've been I did that the other day. So, but doing that here it simply means uh, add. Okay, pop up the URL, not the full URL, just the, the, the domain name, HTTPS and domain name, and then add, and then you need to refresh the browser also so that the browser notices that this has been done. If things do not work, that's probably because you forgot to put to add something to the save domains. And then the third step is create data sets. So okay, let's go here and let's move ahead because uh, connection, uh, adding your address save domain. So we've done that, create Damias data sets. So for that, we're going to go here, here, data set, create data set. And what I can do, well, I can upload from a file. I can uh, take a table of view, a JSON URL. But I can also take an OGC web map service. So select the connection. Well, I have these two. So NOAA radar or NOAA 2. Let's use this one, the new one I just defined. So create. And then, well, this will explore all the data available. Remember the get capabilities code. That's what we do. We send the get capabilities, and the server says, well, I know about this, 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 this. And the, the capabilities or the layers are actually in, in a in a WMS server can be uh organized in directories like in, in folders and so groups and subgroups so i think you could even I, I may be able to just say this and we will actually take them all but let's choose the weather of uh, on uh well caribbean like that i have to give a name on this data set so let's call this uh noah caribbean like this okay and so it's uh it's done. It should be here. So let's uh, let's um, yeah. Well, here it is. Actually, uh, this is the last one I just added here. So there's a, a whole description. Some OGC websites are very verbose. They will say, "Here's what I'm doing," and there's a description, uh, like lots and lots of, of blah. But but this says it's uh, that way. Here's you know, as a text. So now I have this. I can now. Uh, well, take this and uh, add it to a project. So maybe create a new project like this, a project, there it is. And then drag this on the map, just like I would uh, for any others. Now, there's one thing here with the, with the way we, we do, um, I mean, the way the way we interact with this, it's a bit annoying because really uh, when you take a file, like a shape file or anything like that, and you drag it on the map, we automatically zoom and center on the, on the area covered. But here we are unable to do so. I think we should be able to do it. So we need to review how we do that, but we should be able to do it. Because at the end, each of these sub data sets have got their own uh, bounding box, or maybe uh, the NOAA server does not really set the proper bounding box in our window. So I have to do that myself. But here it is now. Here, this is coming straight from the uh, NOAA server. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know how frequently the NOAA server updates this. Well, these are probably some tropical storms uh, going around here. Um, but uh, when I, I can refresh, I can just say uh, refresh layer. And so now it's fetching it again and getting new data if it's changed now. It's not going to refresh automatically if you do it yourself. Okay. So WMS is pretty easy to do. WMS services are, are pervasive. Pretty much all 
um, all public body or, or anybody that deals with the spatial information is publishing it on WMS and WFS. So WFS we can't do yet with Studio, but we will do eventually in the future version. And yeah, I should say also here, you can select multiple of these when there are multiple layers like that. Now, for example, here for the NOAA server, there's one for continental US, there's one for Alaska, Hawaii, Caribbean, and Guam. So you have, you, if you want just Colonial US, you just the first one, and but you can combine them and have multiple of these. Uh, I see Karen is back. She really recovered. And so these are the, the pictures you can do. Something else we can do with the, uh, with, uh, but I think I'm going to cut, cut short. Um, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, there you go. Uh, our local municipality has decided to test their alert service. So we are getting these really, really loud messages on the on our, on our smartphone. You know, plus they keep on calling and calling. And I mean, it's good that they do that, but still it's a bit annoying. Anyway, so yeah, I was saying, <clears throat> I think I'm not going to go through this and show the example. <clears throat> First of all, because we showed that example on the last, uh, last session. And also because you are not that uh, really, not running short yet, but getting there. All right, so this is another thing that we can do. Uh, this is using a, uh, an earthquake server, also for US government, USGS, juridical service. And so here you see J GeoJSON summary feed. Uh, I think the URL will be in the chat if you want, uh, and you can use it. So, and that actually produces the data as a GeoJSON format. We didn't talk about that. You know, we talked about OGC and we talked about WMS, right? WFS. Mm -hmm. um, well, these are a bit old and clunky standards, very efficient, but a bit clunky. Um, we also talked about well known text, another clunky font, but very powerful, actually, more powerful than GeoJSON when you look really deep and GML even, a well known binary, and there's GML, geographic market language, that's a weak now. Why GML? Why not JSON? You know, today JSON is something that has become a de, sort of a de facto standard for data exchange because it's pretty compact. It's not as verbose as uh, GML. It's also uh, more flexible than GML coming from the JavaScript world. Uh, you know, as a JavaScript versus Java. Java is pretty much a bondage discipline. JavaScript is yeah, well you can do it. And whatever you can do, you can do. And so JavaScript uh, and GeoJSON is very flexible and, and lightweight as well. So we see lots of uh, services publishing data in GeoJSON, and that's what they do here. So in, it's a, what they publish in, in that URL here, I'm not sure it is, uh, significant earthquakes and different earthquakes, is this something that's in GeoJSON. And so GeoJSON has three concepts. We'll come back to that later on. GeoJSON geometries, which is just a geometric object, like a shape, polygon, the line, point. GeoJSON feature, which is geometry plus properties, like it's a city, well, name of city, uh, population, these sort of things. And then there's a, a feature collection, which is a grouping of all features as a single document. That's what they publish here. So here, uh, that's what it looks like. If I go and say, uh, you know, earthquake, gov, etc., that's what I will get, you know, this long list of features with each one of them is an earthquake with the location, the time, uh, last update, details, severity, status, alert, reviewed, you know, confirmed, all of these things. And so again, you now go back to our uh, to studio, click this time on, not on uh, OGC, but GeoJSON URL, pop in the URL that we picked up from the, uh, the USGS website. And the data is then fetched by, by the browser directly and then it appears here as a uh, data set again. And of course, with all data sets, I can, uh, well, this says create data set from GeoJSON, so I can uh, maybe uh, you know, look, look at it and see how it looks like. And uh, eventually it appears here. I uh, still need to do a fix, I think, for like a primary key. And now I can add it to a project and then drag it on the project. And here, for example, this will show me all the known earthquakes. I think it's, uh, a certain level of magnitude over the last month, uh, these, these sort of things. And then I can you know, start using uh, you know, clever things, do clever tricks with the studio to, um, well, use different bubble size depending on the severity. 
on the on the Richter square scale, or maybe also uh, uh, the density of these earthquakes based on, on this, based on the um, on the um, heat map, uh, or or do it? Uh, do I have an example? I don't. I thought I had an example here of showing uh, you know count uh, clustering of things and and refresh on demand. Whenever I click refresh, we go and fetch the, the updated data. Right. Now here we can do all these rendering and different ways of showing things because this is data. Okay, it's not WFS, but it is data nevertheless, as opposed to WMS, which is just a picture, and I cannot do much. So all the coloring that has been given to me by um, by Noah, uh, it, I can't change it. That's the way it is. I cannot change that coloring. It's just an image, and there you go. Whereas here, if I was able to get from Noah, maybe I can. I don't know. I didn't look. Um, yeah. Instead of having an image, but having like the areas of the storms and these sort of things, then I could actually do it, you know, use this and then start rendering them in different colors and different ways. Okay, so that's things that we can do with Studio. Other thing we can do, we can also publish the same thing. So not not only consume GeoJSON endpoints, but also publish. Them. That's also something we talked about last time. So I'm going to skip this, but essentially pick one of these and say. And it's there. I don't have to do anything. It's automatically published as a GeoJSON endpoint. So I just click on this. This will give me the URL, and then that's how it looks like. It's uh, what else? A GeoJSON uh, uh, URL. So I can actually publish. I could imagine some uh, you know, studio environment where I aggregate data from multiple sources, maybe forest fires, maybe earthquakes, maybe uh, tropical storms from various sites, merge them together, and then publish them back out as uh, as risk areas using like the same way. Let's look at something different here. I hope, well, I have a bit of time. So Oracle REST Data Services, also known as ORDS. Okay, so ORDS is very powerful. If you don't use ORDS, I recommend you look at this. Now, it might look a bit daunting, but it's uh, actually not very complicated. And uh, so here we have two, two uh, links, one that's pointing to the manual. There are a number of manuals. Yeah, let me look at some of these manuals here, like this. So uh, res data services, uh, and then the books here will tell us, uh, you know, the rest of the APIs. Mostly you probably looking at the developer's guide or actually just at the, uh, where is it, the quick start. And the quick start guide is what you need to get started quickly. Okay? It's just getting started. Uh, how do you use this in, uh, in some examples and demos? Uh, no, pretty easy to do. Where, where, is, where am I here? Here I am. Okay. And there, and there are a number of uh, also, uh, you know, get, get started. So we here discover things and examples and, and the features and explore. It's pretty well documented also. Okay. So, um, Oh, I see there is a question here in the QA. Let me look at this quickly. Can I add layers to Marsh uh, to Spatial Studio via its REST API? Uh, yes, I think you can do that. You can add layers. Um, I, I'm saying I think because we've been, um, I mean, the API has been complete from the start. So it had, uh, but not everything was implemented. So I've been mostly playing with the, uh, uh, with the geocoding because that's uh, one of the most useful things. But you do, you can definitely look for, for data sets. I'm not sure you can actually upload data sets, but you should be able to add data sets or add layer to Studio using it. So drive the whole Studio environment. It needs a bit of testing maybe to confirm. All right, so this is more, uh, <clears throat> and that's how it works. So essentially, it's you no. Know, this is not not very different from from a WFS. If you think WFS is all about, I have some uh, request, I turn that into SQL, and then I get results. Except here, it's more uh, JSON based, so the results are more likely to. They are actually going to be JSON, and on the way in, well, we we sorry, on, on the way in, well, it's going to be just something that says show me that table, or with a query. But it could also be more complicated. You could, in, you could actually invoke PL SQL here, so that do transformation on the fly, and we'll see how that works. This is included with uh, Oracle databases, so on-premise database, but not installed by default. You have to install it. Installing it is actually uh, no, you have various ways. So you, one way is to use what we call the uh, standalone, which is really running to a script, essentially yum install, and then run on, on Linux. 
and then running uh, through steps and say, well, I'm confused. What are the, the URLs, etc. The, the parameters? You can also deploy it in Tomcat or any other application, or deploy it in WebLogic server for maybe production. A bit like Studio. Studio is also standalone as a quick start that you unzip and run. Um, but it's also possible to deploy Studio in WebLogic server if you want to have a higher, more things essentially. Uh, so it's not installed by default with your Oracle database. You have to install it, but it's pretty simple. It is, however, ready for autonomous databases. And ready in what way? Well, as database actions. So if I look at the browser here and look at this, it's RDS here, database actions. Okay, so this is connecting to my local database. Remember, I just started the RDS. In my case, to make it easy, I set it up as a as a service. So it's easier to do, but it doesn't have to be like that. You just can skip to start it up. So here I'm going to connect as Scott and Tiger is the password. And so here we go. And now I'm going to see my data in my data for this particular schema using database actions. Okay. So database actions, when you connect to the Oracle, like an Oracle um, a cloud database, an autonomous database, that would be, for example, here, this connect to my autonomous database. You know, and here I will use, for example, well, admin, okay, the password, yeah, click. Sign in, and now I'm I'm uh, connected to my autonomous database, and I have all of these possibilities I can do to manage my database, to you know create users, uh, what the data to transform it. Not all of these are available on premise. If you look at this here, it's not so much, but uh, but I can manage users, you no know, access to charts, JSON, and, and a few of these. Not as much as in autonomous database, because there I can also do data loading. Well, I can analyze my data, I can transform my data, but it's all under the umbrella of a database action, it means ORDS. All right, um, yeah, that's what I was just showing. <clears throat> installation guide, I'm going to skip this, but you can do the installation fairly easily. There are steps for doing that here in various ways. So what does spatial have to do here? Well, we want to use some REST endpoints for querying and publishing uh, spatial data or spatial querying procedure, and also for GeoJSON. So let's look at some example here. Now, uh, you need to enable, you need to uh, say that particular table is going to be, and schema is going to be enabled for RDS. You don't just want to say everything is going to be enabled because that may be opening too much and not something you want. So enable a schema, for example, here, spatial is enabled as a possible schema tool, like in my case, Scott is enabled or uh, well, admin is automatically enabled in uh, in uh, ADB. But then enable also the objects. Now, these are uh, this is largely done automatically in uh, ADB and actually also in local database. But, but if you create a new table, a new view or something on the fly, then this is something you need to do. So enable object, the name of the schema, spatial, name of the object, name, it, what is it, the table of view. The alias, the alias is the name that is going to be used for accessing, a bit like in, in uh, WFS namespaces, we didn't talk about that. And that's all you need to do. Now you can also do that using uh, SQL Developer. Yeah, just start SQL Developer, pick your table, right click, enable REST service, and that's it. So it's very easy to do that. Uh, and of course, Database actions itself is able to do that. So you can use database actions. So you connect to your, your schema, for example. So I can connect, uh, well, I'm connected here already as a, as a Scott here. So I can go and say uh, this SQL. Um, it will show all my tables like that. And let's say I want to REST enable accounts. Well, I can do right click here and say REST. Well, it's actually enabled. So but maybe some of them is not, maybe flights is not, maybe you can find one which is not enabled. I think they are all, uh, this one is not enabled. So just click enable and, and now it will become uh, available. So just enable, I guess. So here's the URL and, uh, and this. And from now on, I can, I can use it through uh, a, as, a, as a REST endpoint. So what are the REST endpoints that I can use here? Well, this, for example. Okay, I can do this. So let me actually, uh, well, I have to 
yeah, I think I have to do this here to stop this so I can uh, copy paste this and then start with this here. Sorry, showing again and uh, pop it in here. Okay, localhost. Notice it says localhost 8081 by default. That's because uh, it's running on uh, on the VM as 8080, but 8080 is also used by other services. So, so I rename it, I remap the, the, the port to 8081 here. So when I do this, I'm now going to get, uh, yeah, eventually, yes, do it. Here we go. It took some time because there's a, an extension here that actually beautifies the uh, the output. So here, here it is. So here I'm getting this. Now this is not GeoJSON, or actually it is GeoJSON, but only this bit here is GeoJSON. So it's a GeoJSON geometry, but it's not a GeoJSON document. It's not GeoJSON features. It actually follows a structure which is specific to um, to ORDS. So there's an uh, an array of items. So each item is one like a row in a result set. And at the end, <clears throat> there's a total number of, uh, of rows returned. There's a paging mechanism. So by default, it will return only 25. And then I'm getting a URL to fetch the next 25, next 25. So this is so that you know, if, you, if you do that on a very big tip, you don't want to get an HTML page or actually a JSON uh, document, which would be like a 1 million rows the browser will probably die getting this and formatting it. So, so this allows you to build applications that are able to um, get the next, get the next reference or go forward, go backward, which is the way you know, SQL Developer works and actually uh, database actions work as well. So let's see if we can do something here with this. Um, how can I do that you know, from an application perspective? Well, I can do it. Oh, yeah, sorry, something I forgot here. Notice that by default, what we get is this. This is what uh, ORDS will return. That is definitely not GeoJSON at all. We like GeoJSON being geospatial people. So we'd like to see this. This is obtained by just a tweaking a, a config, so a flipping a switch essentially. So setting a uh, option in a configuration file of ORDS that says, please give me GeoJSON. Don't give me this, don't give me proper GeoJSON. And so that's why we get GeoJSON. But again, this is not, really uh, GeoJSON because that should really be an array of properties and that's not what we have here. So still, let's um, let's see what, what happens if I, if I do this in uh, like here, well, curl. Well, this actually does not work. You say, oh, why is it not working here? It does work from the browser. Well, it's because here, you know, of, of this thing here, I think if I, if I, um, I think if I if I wrap this into uh, single quotes, then it might work. This is an effect of the of the shell script I'm using, not of curl or not of uh, anything else. You know? So that doesn't work. So that's okay. I'll just I don't want to do that. I'm just going to remove this. And so here, I'm going to get a list of all my cities. Now this is raw JSON. If I want to see it in a much better way, well, I just pop it into JQ. So JQ is a uh, is JSON query. It's a it's a JSON processor that will command line processor available on all platforms. So Linux, um, Mac OS, Windows. That is is there to let me query a JSON stream and beautify it as well. But let's go back to to this here and 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 he said, yeah, this is not really GeoJSON. Let's try and have GeoJSON. Because GeoJSON is formed of three concepts that are nested. So there's the GeoJSON geometry. So that's a JSON object with a type that says point, polygon, line string, multi-line string, multi-polygon. And then an array of coordinates. Obviously, for a point, there's only going to be a well two coordinates, x and y. If it's um, a very complex polygon, like, uh, well, the... I don't know, for example, uh, parcel boundaries or, or natural features, this can be really, really complex. So we lots and lots and lots of vertices and points. So in that case, we'll have nested arrays for the multiple rings and holes into these rings, etc. 
So it can be very complex. Then we have the feature. The feature takes a geometry and adds properties to it. Now these properties are very much like the one we see here. So ID, city, except these are organized as separate properties, as separate items in, in, in here in that particular object. So ID, city, et cetera, and then location. So what GeoJSON says, it should be like this. You have a properties array. Actually, there's a, no, sorry, not an array. It's not an array. It's a, an object simply with the, with key value pairs, so cities, area, et cetera, and the geometry. And then there's the feature collection. The feature collection is something which will contain a complete result set as a single document, as an array of features. How can we get this output here into that format? Well, that is possible, but we need to, first of all, create the feature collection. So how do we create the feature collection on the fly? Well, for those who followed uh, last uh, month's uh, JSON, uh, we have talked about that. I mean, I, I showed how you can do that and using this select statement, select blah, 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 like this. Okay, so select says it's JSON object, JSON array aggregation, JSON object, etc. So nesting these standard JSON manipulation uh, features of the Oracle database, we can now build a complex uh, result set that is a feature collection like this. One little remark here, this thing here. If if I do this without uh, having these squiggly brackets, then um, ORDS will think, oh, well, look, this is actually a C lob. It's text. So I'm going to quote everything in that text. So escape all the, and returning essentially a big text string, which is sort of okay, but really that's what I want. What I want is JSON, so valid JSON. And so by saying this, we are telling well, yes, hold on. What you are looking at here is not text. It looks like it's text because it says C lob, so therefore it's text. But it's actually a C lob that contains JSON. So treat it as JSON. And so therefore, when I when I do this thing here, curve minus HTTP is uh, C, so the, the, the combined uh, uh, combined structure, I'm getting a feature collection with the with the details like that in proper JSON. The last bit, I think we just why we're running out of time here. So we're not going to go through that. I think this is probably something that deserves a, a separate session, uh, exploring the REST API of Spatial Studio. So I'm just going to um, highlight a few things here that uh, um, that's what you can do with, with, the, with the Studio REST API. So you can find out about status of the server, the versions, read the logs, find about connection, the project task, data set list, like uh, Martin was asking. So upload, export, create, configure the geocoding, do monitor, etc. And so there are two URLs here. One is a, a blog note, a bit old, that talks about what you can do. And then there's a documentation that gives more details about what right now. So I guess it's time to skip to to the end, so more information. There are some URLs here you can follow to find out more about everything we talked about. So there's a live lab that talk about much of this. Although I don't believe we have live lab that combined with ORDS and Studio, something still to do. Documentation, um, LinkedIn groups, or Twitter handles of all of us. So you can ask and ask questions. We'll be happy to answer. There's also a YouTube channel with a, a number of videos about various aspects of spatial. And uh, yeah, I guess questions, uh, there are not too many questions here. I mean, we had a question uh, from uh, from Martin, but if there are any questions, we may be unable to take them because you are running out of time, but you have a contact so you can send the questions to us and we'll read. Okay, so I think we need to close here. I mean, we we're not told to close, but I guess we have to close. Um, the next session is planned for July 25th. I think that's still the case. And the goal of that um, is to talk about something completely different. So let's talk about RASA. RASA data management using your database, which is again, one very big topic, especially if we start introducing uh, the viewing aspects of this, so the loading, the RASA algebra management of, of the data, and then uh, viewing it in the uh, 
in studio, of course. But I welcome you for that uh, event. So it's about a month from now. Okay. Thanks a lot, Abair. Again, thanks a lot, Abair. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And hopefully, uh, we will see you back uh, on July 25th. 